turn our Bibles to Judges chapter 6, Judges chapter 6. I titled the message, Zero to Hero. Zero to Hero. As we are in the book of Judges, and the book of Judges is a time where there is no king. So I would call it the day of no king, where every man did that which was right in his own eyes. As we've been talking about the cycle, we're not talking about motorcycle, we're talking about the cycle of sin, right? And it's a constant cycle that the children of Israel find themselves in. And they would sin, and then God would then chasten them, chasten his people because he loves them, usually under a foreign oppressor, then the people then would cry out to God. Then God would then raise up a judge to deliver the people. As last, a couple weeks ago, we got to see Deborah in action and Joel take care of business for the Lord. And today we're going to look at another judge. Actually, the next couple of weeks we'll be looking at Gideon is his name. And so we're, we're going to be looking at him. So I would say this is going to be a series of the life of Gideon as then God raised up a, a new judge to deliver the people of Israel. Gideon was one of those judges, early 12th century B.C. Israel, in the time of Israel, Israel and Gideon's day, were in a, in, in, they were in a possible situation again. They find themselves again in an impossible situation where they were... Running, hiding in the hills, living under oppression because of their sin, because of their sinful life. Now, the question for us tonight is, have you ever faced what seemed to you an impossible situation? You may be in one tonight. And I mean, it could be financial, it could be physical, it could be, it could be a relational uh, situation. It could be even a spiritual impossible situation. Maybe you have family members that you love and you're praying for their salvation. Maybe it's just having that victory over sin in your life. Anger. Certain strongholds that tend to pick up their heads and have victory throughout, throughout the day in your life. Now, have you ever experienced God's Delight. How God delights in doing the impossible. Do you know that? God delights in doing the impossible. Because that's what we're going to see here in the life of Gideon. We're going to see God do the impossible. And I want to encourage you tonight that God wants to do the impossible in your life. So I would even now, just even if you're taking notes, make a little list of certain things that to you may seem impossible. Because God delights in doing the impossible. In fact, he specializes in deliverance out of the impossible situations. And let me give you some examples as we look to the word of God. Because we can think of a time in Genesis chapter 18 verse 14. Where you had Sarah. What did she do? She laughed at God. Because God told her that she'd be having a baby. Right? God said to Abraham in Genesis chapter 18 uh, verse 14. And yet... What did she do? She laughed at God and basically it says, is anything too hard for the Lord? And as the Lord spoke to Jeremiah of his impeding judgment of Judah in Jeremiah 32 verse 27, again it says, behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Is there anything too hard for me? And the angel who brought up the word of Christ's conception to Mary in Luke chapter 1, verse 37, the Bible reminds us, it says, For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Nothing. Because we serve a supernatural God. We serve a God that raises the living and the dead. We serve a God that does the impossible. So in truth, impossibility is only something encountered by man. 
but it is never a consideration to God. The difficulty lies with us, not God. We can be our worst enemy. We can limit God to our disabilities, to our abilities, to our finite mind, not realizing we serve an infinite God, and we can put God in this box. And so again, the, the, the issue is with us, not with God. And, and when we think about in Matthew chapter 9, 19, verse 25 and 26, after, after conversing with the rich young ruler, Jesus spoke of, of the difficulty for the rich man to be saved. And it says here, when his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men, this is what? Impossible, but with God, let's say it together, all things are possible. Can we successfully deal with impossible situations? How should we face impossible situations of life? How should we deal with them? How should we face them as we encounter them? Some of us daily. As we look at the life of Gideon, and we will identify some of the characteristics of his life that my prayers will help us to learn how God works in them. So as we, as we uh, draw to our text, let's go ahead and look at Judges chapter 6 and read here verses 1 through 6. As we look at here, the relenting enemy. The relenting enemy. It says, then the children of Israel, what do they do? They did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Medians for how long? Seven years. And the hand of the Median prevailed against Israel because of the Medianites. The children of Israel made for themselves the, the dens, the caves, and the strongholds which are in the mountains. So it was whenever Israel had saw the Midianites would come up, also uh, Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them, verse 4, then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no, no uh, sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor oxes nor donkeys, for they would come up with their livestock and their tents coming in a numerous, as numerous as what? As locusts, both they and their camels were without number, and they would enter the land to what? To destroy it. So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel, they cried out to the Lord. So we see here the relentless enemy the ruthless enemy. For 40 years, a generation had passed between chapter 5 and chapter 6, and Israel again was bound in that circle of sin, that cycle of sin, and we see it here in verse 1. And yet the time, the time of, of they were worshiping gods, the gods of the Amorites, we see that here in verse 10. It says, and also I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. So again, we, they find themselves doing what? Worshiping other gods and idol worship. And here they, they have forgotten their true, the true and living God, the God of Israel, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God that God raised up a, a, you know, a, the Midianites then as they, they forsook the Lord, he chastened them through the Midianites to be their what? Their thorn and to draw them back to God. And it is apparent that they came against Israel on an annual base, on, on an annual, there was a period of time where they would come and they would do raids on their land. And what would they do? Well, we see it here in verse 3 and 5. It describes those raids. And it says here, So it was, whenever Israel had sown, Midianites would then come up. <laughs> so it was right when they had sown the harvest, the Israel, they, would, they would come up and they would collect. 
It says they would come up, also the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. Then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza, Gaza and leave no substance for Israel, neither sheep nor oxen nor donkeys. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents, coming in a numerous as, as locusts, both they and their camels were without numbers, and they would enter the land to destroy it. And so we see here they were just outnumbered, they were intimidated, they came with huge amounts of, of people to come against Israel and keeping them in bondage and pretty much having their way, being a bully and having their way with the children of Israel. And that's what we see here. We see it's, it's described that just before the harvest, again, destroying and devouring everything in their path. And the Midianites were like a swarm, as the Bible says, of locusts. If you've ever seen that in some countries or even sometimes on the news, I mean, there's thousands of them. It's like you can't even see anything else. But there's all these, all these locusts. It's amazing. And they were sweeping in at the times of crops and the livestock of God's people were basically compiling them and this forced Israel then to do what? What did they do? Well, think about yourself. If, if that were happening in your life, it would force you then to do what? As the enemy comes and attacks you and intimidates you and pushes you around, right? Bullies you. Oftentimes, what do we do? We retreat. We lock ourselves in, up in our houses. You know, we, we, we're led by fear. We're afraid to go out of our homes. We're afraid to go out and, and represent God. We're afraid to do all these things. And we, and we deal with anxieties and stress and all, all of that. And, and we don't want to go nowhere. Well, that's what happened to them. And for them, they would basically, I mean, the results of this was extreme economical, economical financial hardship. And so what did they do? They, they went and they hid in the mountains. They hid in the caves because they were afraid of their lives. So in response, the people then, what did they do? They turned on the bat light, right? They cried out for help. They were starving to death. They had no food. And they cried out to the Lord. And we see that here in verse 6. It says, so Israel was greatly what? There's the word impoverished, right? They were impoverished. And so in that because of the Midianites and the children of Israel, they cried out to the Lord. So the people again were driven to their knees. They were driven to their knees, but not likely due to any true uh, consciousness of sin, only for what of relief for their oppression. See, the impossible situation in our lives, whatever it may be, whatever we may be going through in our lives, it can be different for every single one of us often has this characteristics in common with the Gideon's experience. The enemy seems to be what? Unrelenting. The pressure seems to be on. You seem to find yourself with your back uh, stuck between a rock and a hard spot. You often feel intimidated. In the difficult circumstances, is an ongoing process. It seems like you're a hamster on a treadmill, can't get nowhere. There's, there does, uh, no, uh, there's, doesn't appear any relief in sight, right? And you just want to get on the plane and fly away, like the commercial, but it's not going to happen. Advil ain't helping anymore. Alcohol's not helping anymore. Drugs are not helping anymore. The reality is, you are in a very, very difficult time. And it may look impossible. There's nowhere to run. There's nowhere to hide. All we want is relief. Well, all of a sudden, here in verse 8, we're going to look at as we move forward, we see God respond to the people's cry. Let's go ahead and read at verse 7. And it came to pass, when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of, of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel, who said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt, and brought you out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all who oppressed you, and drove them out before you, and gave you their land. Also I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my 
voice. So here we see that this unnamed prophet arrives on the scene. In response to the people's cry, the Lord then sends this prophet. And there is a significance in the fact this prophet re remains unnamed. You see, God has sent him. You see, that's all that matters. That's all that was important. One of the things that I find about the Lord is sometimes the Lord will say, wait, right? Sometimes the Lord will say, no. Sometimes the Lord will say, what? Grow. You got to grow a little bit. And sometimes he'll say, go. But he always shows up. He's always on time. And here we see he shows up. He shows up. And that's all that matters. See, people were to hear the message and not, you know, not the man. People are looking for a dramatic big event. In, a, in, a, in essence, I compare it to a firework. Oftentimes, we want an emotional experience to take place in our life. Oftentimes, we allow our emotions to lead us based on how we feel. I'm happy because I got a raise. I'm happy because good things are happening in my life. And oftentimes, we, you know, we seek out this emotional experience, and the reality is, or this big event, and we don't need to, any of that stuff. We don't need to get caught up in a, a preacher that autographs everything or any kind of, you know, well, I'm going to go, you know, hear these guys or that guy or like they're going to make your relationship any different with God. We don't need to get caught up in any big, big name preachers. And oftentimes we do, don't we? What church you go to? Well, my pastor is Pastor So-and-so. <gasps> wow. How long have you been going there? 20 years. Have you met him? No. But I see him all the time. <laughs> And I just feel good just because I know he's been around and he has a big name and, you know, all this other stuff. Listen, we don't need a big event, a big name preacher or a church. Elijah did not find the voice of God in the whirlwind, the earthquake, or the fire, but God spoke to him in a what? Still small voice. And even as we turn to 2 Kings chapter 5, we see another great example of not being caught up in man, but being caught up in the Lord. We have... Naaman was offended in 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 9 through 15. And, God, and it says here, Now Naaman went with his horses and chariots, and he stood at the door of, of uh, Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be stored to you. And you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out, out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. You see, Naaman wanted a man to be out there to, to do this and he wanted to visually to see somebody do some type of, you know, uh, shock and awe because only that way he can be healed. But we see that it didn't happen, right? Because God doesn't need man, right? God can speak to a donkey. What did God want this gentleman to exercise? He wanted him to exercise his faith in the Lord and not in man. And sometimes we get in the way. Oftentimes we get in the way. And he goes on, he says, he says, and so he says, are not the, and these words, uh, forgive me, Abana, Abana and uh, you can read that word yourself. <laughs> par, 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 far, par, okay. The river of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel. Could I not wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went away in what? He was upset. He was enraged. And his servant came near and spoke to, to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean. So he, so he went down, he dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a what? Little child. And he was clean. And he returned to the man of God 
he and his, all his aides, and came and stood before him and said, Indeed, now I know that there is what? No God in all the earth except in Israel. Now therefore, please take a gift from your servant. But he said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will what? Receive nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. So Naaman said, Then if not, please let your servant be given to two mew loaves of earth, for your servant will no longer offer either burnt offerings or sacrifices to other gods, but what? To the Lord. Amen. And so the reality is, guys, we just need to trust in the Lord. We don't need to put our faith in, in a, a church or in a man. We need to put our faith in, in God. Trust in God because God's going to be doing miracles with you in your bedroom, you know, on your knees, praying. Or out in the public. God's going to do miracles with you in, in other areas and just here. Now, yes, should we all fellowship? Should we all have a place that we can come to fellowship with one another? Yes. But at the same time, we want to get caught up with Jesus Christ. It shouldn't have to be some religious duty or some religious act so we can feel like God's there. God is everywhere. Amen? God is everywhere. And He wants to move everywhere. Everywhere. And that's what we see here. We see that God uses the simple, the obscure, the anonymous to do some of His greatest work. Are you needing God to work in an impossible situation in your life? Then we need to quit looking for those fireworks and start listening for that still small voice of God through His Word, through His Spirit. In Psalms 46, verse 10, the Bible says what? Say it together. Be still and know that I am God. I tell you, some of the best times I get to spend with God is when I'm doing my yard work. It just, it's just the best time for me. Some of the best times that I've spent with God were on the freeway, driving to L.A., stuck in traffic. Well, can't, well, can't wave on. I mean, God will meet you anywhere. But we need to listen, be listening for His voice. Because God wants to have a personal relationship with you. Not through a man, but with you. One-on-one, mano-on-mano. He wants to spend time with you. He wants to speak to you. So, it's not important by whom or how it is delivered. What is important is that you receive it. And we see here that he says, I brought you up from where? Where did he bring him up from? From Egypt. He brought him up for, from Egypt. And God spoke through the prophet, reminding Israel how good he was, right? And isn't that how he works in our life? As we look back at our life, we don't look back to, to puff up our testimony or to wish we were there again. We look back as if we were in a car in the back seat and the Lord is driving us now. We look back just to see the place that he took us from. And how good he's been to us. And that's what he's doing. He's, he's reminding Israel of all that he did for them in the past. Because even as we think about how credit is established. How is credit established? Your past. They want to see how you've handled credit in the past. And based on how you handle in the past is a pretty good indicator of how you're going to handle in the future. And so if God is reminding them of their past and how good he's been then he's saying, listen, I'm still the same God. I'm as good as I was yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Amen? I never change. And I'm a fresh God. And I want to do fresh work in your life. And oftentimes we can think about certain things that we've been through even as a church and how good God has been to us. That just gets me excited for what God is going to do. Because God always wants to do something fresh in your life. God always wants to do something good in your life. God always wants to use you to do something great. But do you believe that he can do something great through your life? He can. As I, I, Steve's up here sharing about these schools, and I'm blown away at what God is doing. We, the Summit High School is having a football game tomorrow, so our Bible study got kind of switched around, and those guys were livid. They were not having it. They wanted their Bible study on Tuesday. And I got texts from the football players. Are you coming today? Are you, are you coming to, are we having our Bible study today? And their coach told me, no, we're going to have it on Wednesday. 
So you know what I did? I just showed up at their practice. I showed up at their practice. Why? Because that's where I'd be anyways on a Tuesday, spending time with them. And it just so happened that I forgot to cancel the, the pizza order. So they called me from Costco saying, hey, you got to come pick up your 10 pizzas. So I figured, you know what? We can have some pizza for them after practice. Talked to their coach. He's a great guy, actually. He's cool. He allowed me to be on the practice field. He actually told me, come on out. That's awesome that he would allow me to be on the practice field with them. Then after a couple of the leaders come up and say, hey, can we have our Bible study after practice? I said, hey, sure. The pizza's here. We have our little cards, right? Our Isaiah, uh, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. In other words, the, the, the theme is God has your back. Steve shared a great devotion to the guys. They hung out after. We had pizza. I mean, it was just a great time. Like God, God's just looking for things to do. It, it just show up. A.B. Miller, it's amazing what happened at A.B. Miller. Us does because we had seven pizzas at A.B. Miller. And so we were sitting there. We did a Bible study. And it's like, well, what are we going to do? And I said, look, let's take this time. God you know, said, you need to go out and evangelize. So we're looking at lunch. And there's all these kids having lunch. And we have, we have, we have pizza. And I told our team, I said, look, let's pair up in twos. You, you take a pizza and you help cut the pizza. I said, when they, um, when they come, you give them the pizza. You tell them, Jesus loves you. We want to invite you to the Christian club on such and such dates. And God bless you. That's all you got to do. We went through seven pizza boxes like nothing. It was amazing. And it was great because the kids got the chance to kind of evangelize. And they were all kind of like, it's amazing, teenagers. Huh? They, they don't stop talking. <laughs> Well, then you tell them to talk about Jesus, and what do we say? <laughs> what do we do? That's why they're, they're laughing, because they know. And I'm like, are you serious? C come on, we can do this. They're all quiet. <laughs> Pretend that they're asking you for their number, okay? I'm just playing. It's a joke. But they did a great job. And then second lunch, we were like, okay, we were like, okay, wow, this was, how is it going to be second lunch? And we were just praying. And I had four pizzas left. So I went to the car. We got the four pizzas. And so this classroom is strategically planned right by the lunch line. It's awesome the way God, God had it all set up. So we're walking through all everybody, all the whole lunch area with four pizzas, right? All of a sudden, before we know it, that whole classroom is filled. I'm talking at least about 60 students. If you go to our Instagram, you'll see. So it was amazing. I'm telling you, the kids in the Christian club, they were literally crying. Because they had prayed for, for that for years. You could not pay somebody to do a Christian club last year. It was very depressing. They literally just shut it down. That's how bad it was the year before. And the first, this was their first study. And they had about 60 people in second lunch. And football players were in there. And even Summit, the teacher at Summit, she got a little like, wow. Wow, that's, I'm like, yeah. And it was a blessing. God moved in a tremendous way. A lot of these kids came in for pizza, but they accepted the Lord. And God started stirring it up. And then God showed the Christian club leaders that what? God wants to do the impossible. God wants to do the impossible. And oftentimes we went in there and we get intimidated. We were getting a little hard time from one of the teachers and what have you. And you know, we didn't give up. We didn't quit. We said, we're here, and we're going to do the best what God gives us. And you know what? God did the rest. God showed up like he always does. And I'm telling you, man, we got to see a miracle take place right before our very own eyes. And those kids, a couple of those kids, those Christian club leaders, when they left, they were crying. And I asked them if everything was okay. And they just said, I'm just so overwhelmed with joy right now. And what a blessing. That is A.B. Miller High School. I'm going to keep them in prayer. But God wants to do the impossible. God wants to do the impossible. And so, you may be facing that crisis. Israel needed a reminder of what God did before. This reminded them of the love that God had for them, that God loved them so much, that God never left them or forsook them. God came to their rescue then, and God will come to their rescue now. The God, the love, that God loved them enough to deliver them from Egypt before still loved them enough to deliver them from the Midianites. Because you can imagine, think about yourself, 
you know, being chased out of your home, running up to the mountains, living in caves, as they, the Bible says that they were just living in a very, very difficult time, a pressed time. This reminded them also of the power of God. And I think oftentimes we, we forget about how powerful God is. Don't we? We do, because we get caught up in our routines and our everyday life. We, our faith, we don't really exercise faith. We don't really give God opportunity. Why? Because everything we do is within our control. Our schedules are all under our control. Our life is all under our control. And then when God throws a curveball, all of a sudden, it's like we got hit by a left foot punch and we, we don't know what to do. Like Mike Tyson, you know, discombobulated. This reminds them of the power of God. You know, the God the, was powerful enough to deliver them. But he says here, God reminds him. He says, but you have not what? He says, you have not obeyed my voice. That's what it comes down to, doesn't it? Obedience rather than sacrifice. Because I believe God speaks to every one of us. But do we obey? I got to sit with a young man yesterday about his life. I was talking about his life and he was telling me what he wants to do. He was telling me what his condition was and then what he wants to do. Basically, what he had done with his life was he, like a puzzle, all the pieces were in place, but they were put in the wrong place. And we, that's how we put our life together. See, there's a place for them spiritually. If we look to the Word of God, everything falls into place. God first, right? God first. If you're married, your wife, your kids, then your family, your mom and dad, and then your brothers and sisters, then your friends, but if you have your friends before your wife, then your family before your wife, and everything else, it's all discombobulated. It's not right. But there's an order. And so when we follow that order, God just works everything out. And so, you know, obeying my voice. See, God sent this messenger to tell them. The real problem was, it wasn't the Midianites. Okay, it wasn't, it wasn't them. What was the real problem? While it was the children of Israel, that's what the real problem was. The problem was their disobedience to God. That's what the problem was. See, Israel thought that the problem was the Midianites, the oppression, and all that. That was just the tool that God was using to get them where, where God needed to get them so they can what? Cry out to God. The real problem was Israel. It is human nature, isn't it, to start to do what? To start to blame People, well, when I was a child, you, you did this, or you did that, or that happened, or this is why I'm like this. And we start to do what? We start to blame others for the problems that we cause. We need to take ownership. It's human nature to do that. And, and the messenger here of the prophet also shows that when Israel cried out to God, they didn't understand that they were the problem. It's like David, right? When, when Nathan came to him, he says, what would you do? And David says, I would kill. And that's what he said. You are that man. We often are quick to what? Point the finger at other people to express everything wrong in their life when we got the plank in our eye. Bleeding to death spiritually. Galatians chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, the Bible reminds us Galatians chapter 6, verse 4 and 5. It says, But let each one examine his what? His own work, right? His own work. You don't need to worry about what your neighbor is doing. Let each one examine his own work, and then he will what? Have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall then what? Bear his own load. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 7, verse 2 through 5. We are reminded. It says, For with what judgment you judge, you will be what? You will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the, uh, at the, the speck in your brother's eye but you do not consider the plank in your own eye. 
Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look a plank in your own eye? And there's a big word with an explanation. What does it say? Hypocrites. <laughs> Amen, brother. Preach it. <laughs> <laughs> right? First, what do you need to do? Remove the plank from your own eye. And then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And so you see here, God told him, hey, you have not obeyed me. This is why you're in this situation. And we see here now, then, as we move on, reading from verse 11 through 18, we see here, a hero is going to come on the scene. A judge is going to come on the scene. But he's not a hero at this particular point. What is he? He's a zero. In other words, he's a, he's a, he's a loser, right? He's a zero. And, that's, and that is no other than Gideon, right? So let's read here in verse 11. The Bible says, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Orpah, which belonged to Joash, the Abizarite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press in order to what? To hide. He was trying to hide. What was he trying to hide from? He's trying to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then? Has all this happened to us? Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever said that? God, if you're so good and if you're so real, then why is this happening to me? Gideon's no different, right? He's hiding the wheat. He's hiding this, and he's just, the Lord is coming and he says, then why do we have to, why is this happening? And then he says, and where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. Then the Lord then turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall then what? Save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So he said to him, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Isn't that how it is, right? We complain to God and then God puts it on our lap, gives us the ball. <laughs> I can do a better job, Lord. Okay, here's the ball. Run with it. <laughs> no, I don't want to. Here, you run with it. It's not my job. That's yours. And so then the Lord gives it back to, to Gideon. Then the Lord turned it to him and said, Go into in this smite and you shall save Israel from the hands of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So he said, Oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed. My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Then he said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who talk with me. Do not depart from here, I pray, until I come to you and bring out my offering and set it before you. And he said, I will wait until you come back. And so who do we see on the scene? Well, we see it's not a bird, it's not a plane. It's Gideon. It's Gideon. See, God in his mercy to Israel, he raises up now another judge. And that judge is Gideon. Gideon is one of the most fascinating uh, of all the judges, not necessarily the most outstanding. See, Gideon was from one of the smallest, as he says, the smallest villages of Israel and was the youngest of the remaining of his family, which shows that God works through ordinary people to do what? Extraordinary things. Ordinary people. We can look at the disciples. We can look at David, right? When Samuel went to David's father's house, they didn't even want to bring him out. He was the youngest 
And Samuel was looking for the strongest, the tallest, the oldest. And then his father's like, is there any more? Samuel's like, is there any more? And then, oh yeah, there's little ruddy David out there. The weakest, the youngest, and here he comes. You see, that's how God works. God will use, you know, just the smallest, the weakest to do extraordinary people, to do extraordinary things, to accomplish the task. He was the son of, of a man named Joash, whose other sons had been killed by the Midianites. They lived in Orpah, near the plain. And Orpah was apparently, again, the center of Baal worship. And you can see that here in verse 25. It says, Now it came to pass the same night that the Lord said to him, Take your father's young bull, the second bull of the seven-year-old, and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the wooden image that is beside it. So that, that was the condition. And here we see that we find Gideon. Where, where does the Lord appear to Gideon? Well, we see here that he's at the threshing. He's thre threshing wheat at the threshing floor. Uh, actually, he's not even at the threshing floor. It's at, the, it's at a wine press. And it was not yet harvest. Threshing wheat by hand was slow and tedious work yielding very little results. But the reason for these actions was, of course, again, fear from the, the invading, the invasions of the Midianites because that's not how threshing wheat was normally done. This was, this was more of a tedious type of work. But that was because, again, he was trying to hide it from the Midianites. That's all they had. So he had to do it in a way where it was undercover. It was a lot harder to do it that way. But we see here the, character, uh, the characteristics of Gideon. What characterized Gideon? What qualified Gideon as a leader? What qualified him as a leader? Note the following characteristics of Gideon's life, which are immediately apparent. And we see the first thing that he had was fear. He had a fear. We see that in verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Orpro, which belonged to Joash, the Bizarites, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. He feared and he was hiding it. And if we see here that he had this fear, it was, it was again, not, it was not a traditional way to, to thread that, that uh, threshing the wheat, but he did it any, anyways, even though it was labor intensive. This account merely reveals Gideon's humility. He, after all, had not bowed his knee to Baal. Though all around him, including his family, as we read in verse 25, had adopted worshiping the heathen gods of Baal. So he had a fear, but then he also had a faith. And we see that in verses 12 through 14. He had a faith. We see that the Lord, the Lord uh, in verse 12 when this angel, it says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. And so what do you, what do you when you see that, what do you call that? That's called, we, we call that epiphany of God. It's where God shows up. The angel was actually God, Jesus, speaking to Gideon. Okay? And so the Lord appears to him in verse 12. And where is the Lord now? We see in verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 and 10, the Bible says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that in the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but what? But not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be what manifest in our body. And so here we see Gideon, the Lord appearing to Gideon. But for us, where is the Lord? Where does he dwell today? Through the power of the Holy Spirit in every single one of us. We are the earthen vessels and he is our what? Treasure, possession. What makes us special? Not because of what we possess on the outside, but what we possess on the inside. Amen. As believers, we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now we hold, the Bible says, you are the living temple of God. Every single one of you. 
that He dwells in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And He says it right here. But we have this treasure. What is this treasure? What is this earthen vessel? The, our bodies are this earthen vessel, right? And this earthen vessel is decaying. It's falling apart. But it says that the excellence of the power, what is that? Of God may be of God and not of us. And, and the reality is we are hard pressed on every side, aren't we? Hard pressed on every side. We wake up. We have the flesh to deal with. We leave. We have, you know, we have the, the enemy, the world to deal with. Then we have Satan on top of that trying to attack us. So we're hard pressed on every side. But he says here, yet we're not crushed. I will not be moved. I will not be moved. You think about the Christian when we are under attack and we rely upon God. We respond, right? When the church is under attack, what happens? We wake up. All of a sudden we're like gremlins. We start popping up everywhere. The best thing that can happen is put us under pressure. True believer, the best thing you can do is put us under pressure. Then God responds through our life. So we are hard pressed, but yet we're not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, amen, but not forsaken. Are we struck down, but not destroyed? Why? Because we're always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. And so the things that we go through, the, the persecution we go through, we get a glimpse of what Jesus went through for, for us. A glimpse. We get a smidgen, like the Lord says, okay, turn the heat up a little bit. Okay, I'm going to let you just, just a little bit, just experience what I went through. And some of us are like, oh, Lord, this cross you gave me is too heavy. I can't bear it no more. I can't carry it no more. So then you get to heaven, and then the Lord says, okay, that cross that I gave you is too heavy. Oh, yes, Lord. This, this is too heavy for me. So then God looks at you and says, okay. Then trade it in. Look around you. There's crosses all over the place. Trade it in. So you go in. You say, okay. You look around. You see big crosses. Oh, no, not that one. That's too big. Medial, medium crosses. No, that's still too big. You know, wooden crosses. Oh, no, I get splinters. All of a sudden, you look down by the, 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 the pulpit there, and there's this nice little shiny little golden cross. And you look and you say, God, that's the cross I want. That one right there. That little one. Shiny and pretty and all clean. And the Lord looks at you and says, really, you want that cross? Yes, Lord, give me that cross. And then the Lord looks at you, pauses and says, really? That's funny because that's the cross you brought in. Why? Because oftentimes we think that our cross is heavier than everybody else's. That our cross is too heavy to bear. That's why I love our afterglows, because then when people start sharing certain things they're going through, you realize, man, Lord, forgive me, because I've been complaining for nothing. Amen? So we see here in verse 14, the Lord's commission in verse 14. It says, Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall what save Israel from the hand of the, the Midianites. I have not, I have not sent you. Have I not sent you? So that's the commission. Have have I not sent you? God is sending him. And then we see the humility in verses 15 and 16. So he said to him, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? We see his humility. In my weakness, you'll be made strong. Indeed, my clan, right, is what? The weakest in Manasseh. And I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. So we see his humility here. In 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9, The Lord is looking. You may say, but I, I can't. I don't have, I'm not qualified. I don't have what it takes, Lord. Send somebody else. I can't do it. It says here, first, Second Chronicles 69, For the eyes of the Lord, they run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those 
whose heart is loyal to him. In this you have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on you shall have wars. Isaiah 66 verse 2. For all those things my hand has made, and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look. On him who is what? Who is poor and of contrite spirit, and who trembles at my word. See, God is not looking for abilities. God is looking for availability. He's looking for humility. He's looking for weakness. And that's, you know, for us men, man, that, is, that doesn't seem right, does it? Well, I want to encourage you because I know for a lot of men, we deal with anger. And, and when something doesn't go our way, we, we use that anger. And I'm not just saying men, it could be women too. But that's not God. God uses weakness. God uses humility. Meekness. All those things that we, we think that, that we're to be strong and to go after certain individuals. But the best thing we can do is we humble ourselves as much as it hurts. We, we, we give a soft answer. What does it do? It turns away wrath. Right? God uses the weak things of the world what, to confound the wise. I tell you, I'm the farthest from anybody that can ever thought that God would use, ever even thinking about being a pastor. I was so always, I always had this uh, doubt because of the disabilities, like I say, that I carry within my own self-conscience. We all have those, don't we? Whether it's a crooked toe or a finger or something, every single one of us have certain imperfections that we don't want nobody to know. Then you get married. <laughs> All of a sudden, every time you get into that, that disagreement, because we never argue, right? Then there, that's, that's like the button right there. That one button, it just comes out. It's like, no, you didn't. You had to go after the crooked toe. <laughs> <laughs> that, we don't have crooked toes, though. But anyways. <laughs> but yeah, so we allow those disabilities. We allow those, those imperfections to cripple us. And the enemy loves to remind us of those areas of our life. He loves to, to remind us of them. Even as Paul was reminded by the enemy, what did, what did Paul say? He says, listen, I don't look back, right? I leave all things behind. I press towards the goal of the call of the upward call in Christ Jesus. Why? Because the enemy would remind him, oh, look at you now. You think you're a mighty man of God? But weren't you Saul a minute ago, killing people, persecuting them, kicking the same people out of their houses? Now you're claiming that you want to you help them? You want to serve this God that you were once persecuting? So we see here, again, the Lord is not looking for ability. He's looking for availability. And God uses the weak things. And so in that, we see that Gideon also, he was focused. He was focused. Why? Because, in other words, where, where do we find him at? We find him working, don't we? We find him at the threshing floor. Threshing, you know, that wheat. Taking care of business. He wasn't, you know, taking the playoff. He was out working very hard. He was focused on that call. On doing what was right, even in that type of oppression. He wasn't just sitting, you know, moaning and whining and complaining and, oh, woe is me. I lost my job. Oh, woe is me. I lost my house. Oh, woe is me. Uh, my girlfriend broke up with me. Snivel went. He actually kept busy. What does the Bible say? Live as if Christ were coming back. Live in such a way as if Christ were coming back the next hour. We have no time to take a playoff. Be productive in everything that we can. And we see that was, that was what he was doing. I want to encourage you. Fear of losing our job. Pressure of the unpaid bills. Anxiety. Raising kids. I'm telling you, I haven't had little ones around. But I know for you families that have little ones, I pray for you. Because it's not easy. Family, relationships, all those things. These are all legitimate concerns. But God calls us to look above, to rise above, to expand our horizon, our horizontal of reality. In the impossible situation, whatever it may be for you, we are often focused on ourselves. We have therefore limited our vision. Philippians 2, 4 says, Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also what? For the interest of others. In John 4, 35, it says, Do you not say 
there are still four months, and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. Colossians 3, 2 says, set your mind on what? The things above and not on the things of this earth. Some of us are like ostriches. We have our heads stuck in the sand. We got we to gotta be like giraffes, right? We got we to gotta get our eyes on the Lord. So we have here the deliverance of Israel was Gideon's own and, and the Lord told him, I will be with you. I will guide you. First Timothy 4.16 says, Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine continuing in them for in doing this you shall save both yourself and those who hear you. And in conclusion, as we get ready to take communion tonight, your impossible situation may be more about what God wants to do through you than what He wants to do for you. Have you ever thought about that? Because it's not about us. He may be using your situation to get you in front of somebody that needs to hear the gospel. But if you have your eyes on yourself, you miss out on what God wants to do. Let me say that again. Your impossible situation may be more about what God wants to do through you than what He wants to do for you. How should I face my impossible situation? How should I do it? Well, when a situation is unrelenting, don't run from it. Okay? Don't run around it. Go through it. Even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I fear no evil. Why? Because the Lord is with me. We don't need to run. We don't need to look for an easy way out. What we need to do is hold on to God, hold on to your wife and your family, and you go through it. I can tell you, being married 15, uh, seven, going on 17 years now, one of the things me and my wife do when there, when there comes a situation that falls upon us, which oftentimes they do daily, if not multiple times, our ushers, you guys can come up and get ready to uh, get communion out. You know what we do? Well, you can be like, you can be like, the, uh, we can be like the donkeys or we can be like the stallions. You know what donkeys do when they come under attack, under pressure? A group of donkeys, they start kicking each other. Or is that the stallions? What are the twos? All right, my wife, yes. So and what do the stallions do? See, my wife knows her eyes. That's right. What, are, what do the stallions do? They put their heads together and they kick outward. Right? They kick outward. So when the situations are relenting, we don't run from it. We don't deny it. We don't ignore it. You know what we do? Give it to God. Can you say give it to God? Give it to God. We give it to God. <laughs> Lord, this is your problem. That's what I do. <laughs> Lord, this is your problem. Handle business. Take care of it. And do what you need to do. Here I am. Use me, right? We need to remember this unnamed prophet. Look for God's answer in that still small voice. And how do we receive his answer? Through the word of God, through the spirit of God. It could be through a fellowship, through a brother. And then lastly, number three, uh, we need to unlikely deliver. Could then, Jesus can then come up on the scene, right? It could be God. God wants to do something great through your life. Do something great through your life. And what we're going to do right now is we're going to have communion. Because even as we think about all these different things, what separated the children of Israel from God? Was it the Midianites? No, it wasn't. It was the fact that they did not obey God. It was the fact that they turned and walked away from God. It was their sin that separated them from God. You see, our desire should all be what it says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. The Bible says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundant above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever and ever. You see, God is in the business of doing the impossible. But you know what? If you want to see God do the impossible, then we got to be like the children of Israel. And we got to repent. Right? we got to repent. See, Gideon, they cried out. They recognized. They said, Lord, we need you. And so as we sing this song, as we take communion, maybe we're not in line with the Lord, that we can do that. Between you and God, at your seat, 
You know, the Bible talks about examining yourself, right? See, we can take that plank out of our eye right now. Right now, okay? We can take that plank out. Then, after we do that, we can go help our brothers. Amen? In love. One another. We can bear each other's burdens together. And so, let us pray. And as the communion comes around, that you would just examine your, your, your life. And if, if you don't want to make that commitment with God, if you want to make that connection to get right with God, that's okay. Just let the communion pass from you. And um, we'll just continue to, to worship Him. Father, we thank You. Lord, even as we think about Gideon, and, and he really is a zero. He's really just a nobody, Lord. And you looked at his life, and yet you had a purpose for his life. And he was, even as he, he says, I'm weak. Our tribe's one of the weakest. I mean, what do I have to offer you, Lord? And the reality is we have nothing to offer you, Lord. It's not about what we have to offer you. It's about what you had to offer us. It's about what you did for us on that cross of Calvary. Lord, as you did the impossible that, that day, Lord. When the world, when the evil thought they were having victory, Lord, and put you on that cross, Lord, you turned it around and you used it for good, Lord. And you did the impossible. Never, ever in history has anyone raised from the dead besides you, Lord. And so, Father, that's impossible. That's the impossible. So even as we come to take communion tonight, Lord, I pray you would touch our hearts, you would examine our lives, and you would even begin to do the impossible in our lives, Lord. And for some of us, it may be just, it may be the impossible, maybe stop cussing, maybe stop drinking, it may be stop smoking. It may be something, we start small, we can start there, and that you would do the impossible there. Help us to deal with our anger. Help us to love our wives, our children. Help us to be faithful to you, Lord, in making that commitment may be impossible, Lord, that you would right now, Lord, have your way and start to do the impossible in our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's children say, amen. Amen. amen, amen. So I would encourage you, even as communion comes around, that you would just continue to pray, spend time with God, and listen to that still, small voice, and then respond to it. He wants to talk to you.